Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who hasn't joined us uh, in the past. I'm just going to quickly run through some basic housekeeping slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter today. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time and ha hasn't been with us before, we have two companies uh, presenting this morning. We generally run these every fortnight or weekly, uh, as it has been more recently. Uh, the two companies have a 30 minute slot, which we generally break down into a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes then left open for q and If you do have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to uh, moderate the, the Q&A session. Please also note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So if a presenter does happen to flip over a, a particular slide um, too quickly, you can go back and watch this webinar and the previous, uh, I think, 24 webinars that we've had uh, to date on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. Um, where can you find Coffee Microcaps? Uh, you can find us on Twitter at C Microcaps. As I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and all our previous webinars. LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. And I also write a weekly paid uh, newsletter, which you can find on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, our first presenter this morning is going to be uh, Mark Watkin, Global CEO for Bike Exchange. And after that, we're going to have Steve Dropulich, Managing Director of Valmec. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Mark. So Mark, if you want to start sharing your screen. Yeah. Uh, just flick to slideshow mode, Mark. Yeah, uh, you're about to full screen. I can see your cover slide now, Mark. You're all good. Okay. Thank you, Mark, uh, for the opportunity and uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, really excited to just take you through Bike Exchange and the journey that we've been on and uh, which resulted in us listing um, the business uh, two, uh, well, about six weeks ago now, February the 9th. Um, so just a little bit of background, just some key personnel, a little bit about myself. I, I joined the business about um, three and a half years ago um, after meeting the co-founders, Jason and Sam, um, who uh, were moving into uh, another area of the business uh, called Marketplacer. I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. And they wanted someone to come in to focus on bike exchange uh, globally. Um, you know, they, they'd grown the business over seven years in, in just Australia, and then it started to branch out into uh, other countries. My background was running advertising agencies. Um, so it, it, it prepares you for quite a lot, running an advertising agency. Um, and I've always been a, a huge uh, sports fanatic and cyclist. So perfect crossroads for me and um, uh, I've, I've not looked back since since joining Bike Exchange. Uh, Andrew Demery uh, joined us last year, um, great pedigree, uh, former car sales.com uh, limited uh, CFO, where he was there for five years, a so great marketplace experience and he's been a terrific addition to the team. Uh, and then just the, the way that our transaction um, were shaped uh, through the course of last year. Greg Taylor, who's the Chief Investment Officer of Bombora, who now sits uh, on our board as, as Chairman, uh, along with Brian Zekulich, um, who is our Risk and Advisory uh, seat on the board from Bombora. Um, we've constructed a really nice uh, board there to take us into this next chapter. And I'll touch on some of the other key roles as we go through this presentation. So bike exchange, you know, uniquely is, is this, you know, world's leading bicycle single category marketplace. 
you know, by virtue of a lot of the work we've done over the, over the years, we've created this network of brands, retailers, and distributors that come together in this single destination marketplace for the benefit of the consumers um, to shop everything bike. But we quite often say that we're enabling the industry. It's quite a fragmented industry, um, and we're bringing it all together. And it's allowing the industry to trade and scale find a, a, a consumer base uh, and, and being a single category marketplace we know when someone's coming to bike exchange that they are shopping for a, for a bike as i touched on we've we've grown from you know our australian roots um, into eight countries or four hubs now where we we look at the business anz north america europe uh, and and latin america um, and we're now we're actually when we listed we were about um, just coming into the listing about 40 people we're now pushing over 50 people globally um, one of the big areas of the business historically has been generating um, sales leads and inquiries into retailers and brands e-commerce has grown significantly over the last two years but those um, uh, sales leads and inquiries on an annualized basis are, are in the region of about 1.5 billion dollars and i'll talk to, to the opportunity there and how important uh, that has been, you know. And the journey into the IPO is that we we've done that that growth really on a capital light basis. So, you know, the the IPO listing, um, and and why we did it was really to enable us to to get that scale um, uh, as we grow grow forward. How does it all work? Well, we've got this dedicated consumer base coming in. Uh, to our sites and we've got individual marketplaces in each of those countries that's dictated by how bikes are distributed around the world and then the discrete retailer bases for each of those countries each of those you know core sites has a, a, a master admin site and then we've got central product database of over 600,000 products which is growing all the time which is imagery product descriptions all the key um key details and then a big piece of work that has happened over the last two to three years are the integrations into all the different types of point of sale systems and web shop fronts around the world and that's to give us um live inventory coming up onto the site which is a really important thing not only from a management and operational point of view if you're a retailer or a brand but from a consumer experience so when you're on the site and you're looking at all of the products or refining a search, you know that um, generally it's going to be live inventory and product coming up uh, onto onto the platform. Propositionally, you know we're, we're different to uh, an e-commerce pure play because of our breadth of brands um, and and breadth of products. Um, that, that that's a, a great consumer experience uh, proposition yet again because it, invariably people want to shop the market. And refine their, their search and so we, we, that brand list is extending all the time across bikes parts and accessories and, and so forth um, and and i say you know our competitive advantage or, or, or differentiation um, is is you know different with these core brands when you look at the pure plays the pure play online um, retailers invariably they've got a, a narrower uh, brand uh, offering so that breadth of choice is important for the for the consumer which I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit that audience that uh, big numbers you know generally our, our traffic has, has has grown organically over the years 85 to 90 90 percent of our traffic is is organic well optimized site across product category uh, and content evergreen content which comes up in search you know, over 230 million searches a year. The female audience has grown about 10%, which is great to see um, over the last 12 to 18 months. But the interesting thing here is really the core category growth uh, and the macro, the macro changes that are affecting cycling. It's not necessarily at the performance end, but which continues to grow. It's more the mass market end, uh, driven by e-bikes, but you know, commuting and all of these different areas that's certainly what we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months and that's the exciting 
um, component for uh, our category. Um, you know, the onset of, of COVID and, and the sort of changes and shifts we've seen there and uh, certainly areas that have accelerated around infrastructure, the way we work, the way we live. Cycling is definitely a, a core part of that uh, solution as we progress. And there's a lot of research and interesting stats coming through. Uh, one being that cycling will be the second most popular form of transport behind public transport in the next 20 years um, as infrastructure um, gets better and better and people realize that it is a viable option uh, for transport. And I think that's probably the reframing of cycling in that you know, cycling isn't just a sport, it's actually a, a mode of transport. When you look at our revenue model, we've got three core uh, revenue streams, which is it's nice to see. A lot of marketplaces just have the e-commerce transaction flip, uh, the subscriptions, um, which the retailers and the brands uh, are charged a monthly subscription. That, that varies depending on what they're getting, their size, and functionality, and also the communication support that we, we bundle within that subscription. We get that live integration happening between um, Bike Exchange and then that, that point of sale system to get it up onto site. And invariably, they're, they're uh, up and running on the platform fairly quickly. Um, and then the, the, there's a full admin site which allows them to publish the products that they wish and also to um, you know, monitor uh, you know, sales and inquiries through the platform. Then there's the e-commerce transactions. As I mentioned earlier, this has grown over the last um, 18 months in particular, as more and more products and more retailers have become enabled. Effectively, what happens, an example there on a $2,000 purchase of a bike on Bike Exchange, we take those funds as merchant of record. The retailer sees that order comes, comes through, coming through. They fulfill the order, and then upon fulfillment, we'll automatically release the funds, less any commission uh, that we've agreed um, with that retailer. Um, and then the third tertiary sort of area is, is media. We've got a programmatic display platform on site. We've traditionally done some direct media sales, which hasn't been a, a focus in the last 18 or so months. We have private classifieds, which represents probably, you know, one to two percent of the overall inventory. And it's certainly an area that we're, we're going to be looking at a little bit more. And then we've got some other ancillary products and services, which which um, such as feature ads and, and, and so forth that uh, generate some, some revenue. But certainly those first two um, pillars are our core revenue streams. And we've got this interesting blend now of revenue as e-commerce transactions and volumes have gone up um, to uh, the, the extraction of, of that commission through to our net revenue. The competitive advantage, you know, we talked to the fragmented market and how we're bringing it together and very much enabling, you know, the industry across brands, retailers and distributors. It's that single des destination, the ease, convenience and choice for consumers. Um, it, it, invariably, you know, you think about the, the, the average consumer may not know much about bikes. It's quite a daunting process. It's a technical process and we aim to demystify that. It's a low cost entry point for retailers and brands, um, you know, to get that e-commerce offering and get access to that extensive audience. Um, and we've created this interesting network around the cycling industry. And one of the, the key areas that's popped out of that is the data and insights, which is very much an area that we're looking at to commercialize as we progress. Importantly, it's an omni-channel offering. The retailer is still an important part uh, in the journey of buying a bicycle and, and, and invariably we're doing deposit payments, uh, click and collect as well. So people can touch and feel the bike after securing it online. And that's an important uh, part, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, we've done all of the growth to date, you know, prior to the capital raise and, and IPO on a capital right basis. But what we've got is a very strong foundation to build off. So just some highlights um, based on our half year sort of uh, report to market just shortly after we uh, listed, you know, our total transaction value 
um, you know, on a look-through basis, grow, growing 116% uh, versus the, the um, PCP. Strong growth across all markets. Europe's been a real standout for us. 96% of transactions in, in Europe are bikes. Over 50% of them are e-bikes. Just gives you a sense of culturally what's happening there. Traffic, again, double uh, is pretty much, uh, you know, at the high end, 77% versus the, the, the PCP and that inquiry value again up around 100%. And then the e-commerce commissions again is growing over 325% there versus the, the PCP. So volumes, transaction growth, all really nice. And the active retail accounts are sitting around that, that sort of 1500 mark um, as at the end of the year. And, and I think the blend of that subscription and account growth is 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 is, is where the, the business is changing. We've got some more premium subscriptions coming through where we're working more with um, you know premium retailers and also with the brands themselves. And that's not to cut the, the retailers out, it's more about um, uh, con connecting up brands with the retailers and making stock available across the dealer base. Um, we've started now deploying some of that capital into digital marketing, SEM uh, in particular, which is something we haven't um, uh, invested in to date, and we're seeing some strong um, results from that. And then obviously key hires. I mentioned Andrew at the beginning, which was prior to the IPO, but we've now got some key, key, key resources and skills coming in, building out the sales team uh, around the world to, to build that. Um, a subscription and account growth and then there's some strategic te technology development um, but ultimately you know the ipo raised 20 million in capital there's no debt on our balance sheet and we're in a strong position to um uh, to, to grow forward from here key metrics arpa which is based on subscription has grown touched on that active retailer account that traffic growth the the, the growth in e-commerce e transactions and then average order values going up nicely, as is the, the commission rates. The average order value is different around the world. Obviously, in, in Europe, as I mentioned, uh, it can be to the tune of 1,500 uh, euros, uh, given the, 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 the lean more towards bikes versus parts and accessories. So that's an overview of the business. Um, and, and happy to, to take uh, any questions which may have come through. Um, uh, while I've been talking. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I, I've got actually a few from somebody who uh, couldn't join us this morning, but I think it's going to watch it back. Um, so they've sent in a few. Um, they want to know, is there an Asia hub in the works? And if there is, you know, where would that ideally be lo located? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. It's something that we've looked at um, over the years. We get approached quite a lot about starting in new countries. I think the first point is that you know, now we're very much focused on what we've got. We've got four hubs uh, with those eight countries. You know, we, we're mature in Australia, but the, the, the penetration in, in Europe and uh, America is still sort of high single digits. So the runway to growth there is significant. Not, notwithstanding that Latin America as well, which is our sort of youngest country, uh, is a huge opportunity too. So we really want to focus on Europe and, and the US. Uh, currently and, and growing those out because we feel that that's you know got significant uh, benefits to it uh, notwithstanding that we you know we do hub and spoke into other regions so Germany has hub and spoke into Belgium and Netherlands it'll be a similar approach in in Latin America where we're in Colombia at the moment um, but yeah we certainly you know we've looked at, at Asia I think Korea Japan are interesting to us um, but I would suggest that we're just going to focus on what we've got for the moment. Okay, and then the another question they had was um, on um, ancillary services. Um, you know, is there a potential for you know you to act as that kind of e-commerce or or agent for you know biking holidays or or entries yeah. into the big bike races? And they have in brackets here amateur ones. So. If I take yeah. or hear from South Africa, say the Cape Epic, you know, I know the entrance fee is about, I think, $12,000 uh, for a, 
for a team. So, I mean, a 10% commission and that isn't a bad commission. No, that's right. I think it's a good point. We do, we, we, we have branched into other areas, ancillary services, um, uh, holidays, entries uh, into races in, in Australia. So that's, that's seen some success. So yeah, it's an area that we've, we've, uh, we've, we've done in, in this region. Um, and we'd look to, to absolutely expand that because it makes complete sense from a, uh, the first thing that comes is generally a bike. And then once people start to get into it, there's all the opportunities around racing and uh, servicing health related services, all of those. So executed appropriately, it's, it's very powerful. And I think one of the, the key areas that we're looking at and we've spent a fair bit of time over the last six to eight months is single customer view, which is, you know, our existing customer base and members and actually then talking to them, you know, in a relevant fashion, you know, that we know that they're a mountain bike or a road rider or they've bought a, an urban e-bike and then serving relevant products or content, which is, um, is, is relevant to, to, to how they are using a bike or on their, their, their individual circumstances. And that's just building out the customer lifetime value. So yeah, definitely events, holidays, all of those things are, are a key component of that. Okay, and then I'll take one or two from the audience here now quickly. Um, churn through the retailer base, you know, what has that looked like? You know, maybe a bit hard to mm -hmm. give a good gauge in, in those newer markets, but, but if we take maybe the Australian market is, as you say, it's mature, you know, what historically has kind of been retailer churn you've experienced to date? Yeah, it, it's. I think if you hit the sort of nail on the head there. It's, it's it's very different by market, and you know it takes four to five years to establish each of these markets. You know, and that's why I say we're at a very nice juncture because we've done the hard work. You've got to get the retailers, the products on first before you go out with big marketing pushes and the traffic's coming organically. So in you know in the US, you know we didn't. In those early years, we didn't get everything right. I don't think any any business does. You you learn from your, your mistakes, but got to that strong sort of foundation and and of course you see that the churn there and just different ex ways of signing up the stores and so forth but in australia now the the, the churn is is you know it's it's, it's very small in, in low single digit percentages and really the um the churn that can come is unfortunately some stores you know shutting down um uh, and, and the operations you know they're closing so we've we've got around 70 percent of the retail base in in australia um and you know in the europe and the us region it's sort of eight nine percent of total retailers so you can see that the um the potential there and i think the shift in the business now has been around quality we want quality of retailers and quality of product on the platform as opposed to you know huge volumes of, of retailers um, because you want the good operators um, uh, who, who are going to use the platform have got good product inventories which which ultimately gives the consumer a really good experience so there's a, a slight strategic shift there and also with the volumes of e-commerce transactions now coming through um, you know that, that's that, that that's a you know key revenue driver for us so there's a, there's a bit of a balance there between subscription and, and e-commerce. And then another one, I think you might have touched this on in the presentation, but um, what percentage of total bike sales are completed on the platform? So if you look at Australia, you know, annual mm. revenue versus how much yeah. is going through your platform, you know, again, I think it's probably the most relevant market to kind of gauge that. Yeah, in terms of bikes, you know, that. There's a couple of, in, you know, I think interesting stats. If you just take it up a level, just, you know, on a macro basis, like in, in, in Europe, 30% of, of retail in total is done through e-commerce. Yeah. So culturally, it's, it's, it's ahead of Australia. I think latest stats I was looking at, it's, it's high single digits of e-commerce retail going, going through as, as a total of percentage of the total retail so we've still got you know a long way to go and it's absolutely fair to say that the maturity of people buying bikes 
in Australia has, has been slower, but we've definitely seen the acceleration of that. So in terms of just pure you know, volume, it's around 30% of, of total uh, dollar volume, uh, which is bikes. You know, it's still a lean more towards parts and accessories um, uh, on e-commerce, but as I touched on a little bit earlier, uh, mechanisms like deposit payments, uh, click and collect, really to start to take the friction out of, of the journey. And, and as we get you know, deeper on technology and tools which can help those you know, friction points in the journey, uh, it will only get better. One of the, the big areas that we've invested in and uh, we've started with the resource now uh, since the IPO is, is something called Concierge, which is like a white drop service which is, is there to help the consumer with their, their particularly bike purchases. Um, and that's proving uh, really, really, um, uh, you know, uh, potent and, and, and strong uh, because it's effectively getting the consumer at the point of consideration with their inquiries and helping them and, and converting to that transaction. And that can just be a deposit or it can be a full e-commerce payment. So it's a win-win-win scenario. You're getting that consumer at the point of consideration. You're getting a transaction happening on platform, and and uh, that, that can be driving into the retailer for for pickup, or even it's it's just shipped direct. So it's we're definitely seeing it improving, um, and, in, and in different parts of the world, Europe in particular, it's already you know very very strong. And then uh, if I can just go back to one, the final question was emailed in ahead of time. Um, what's the the kind of breakdown of product vertical so i think they want to know sales you know is kids bike the biggest product vertical or mountain bikes or road bikes uh, or yeah. e-bikes uh, you know um i know you mentioned the growth rates i think on a, on a slide but w- yeah. which one of those verticals i guess is your, is your is your biggest one currently yeah look i think it's interesting like mountain bike by search um is 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 probably now the the biggest um and you can break that down into quite a few subcategories. Um, and I think there's a few trends there. There's, you know, the people you know, coming off the roads and, and, and accessing, you know, countryside also, you know, there's some degrees of mountain bikes which are used just for everyday riding. Um, definitely children's bikes, um, you know, through COVID, um, you know, blossomed even more, um, you know, with a lot of families accessing cycling as as sort of limitations were there with what we could and couldn't do uh, but, but you know we've seen that continue um, the performance end uh, and road uh, in particular it's still still growing uh, and there's subsets of that category now coming through gravel cross all of those those different types and you know we're seeing strong growth in those areas and then e-bike is probably the one which you know is seeing really strong uh, category growth. The barriers are sort of dropping. People are understanding uh, more about them. Uh, and you can break that into the, the urban comfort e-bike and then e-mountain bike. Um, and, and they're both bringing new people into the category because you know, in an urban situation, people are, are seeing, well, actually, I can commute to work and, and, and some of the limitations or barriers that might have been there with a normal bike are removed and then from an e-mountain bike you're seeing lots of interesting sort of social studies come through where generations of families are riding together in you know undulating countryside you know so grandfathers riding with their their grandchildren um and you know the the e-bikes assisting there which which is really nice uh, nice to to sort of hear those um types of stories so yeah, lots, lots happening there. And I just think that the, the opportunity for the category has just, just grown uh, in that transportation space, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Mark, I think we'll leave it there. We're just exactly on time. Uh, so neatly finished that answer. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And yeah, the contact details are there if anybody wants to get in touch uh, with you or with Susie. And I'm going to hand over now, if we can, to our second presenter. So, Mark, if you could just stop sharing your screen. Thanks for the opportunity. No problem. Thank you. And then, Steve, if you want to start sharing your presentation. 
uh, it's coming through now and just go to uh, yeah slideshow mode Yeah, you're on to full screen now, Steve, so you're good to go. Just If you can just unmute, Steve. Okay, how's that? Perfect, there we go. Wonderful, all right. Okay, so thank, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity to um, present this morning. Um, subscribers, I'd uh, uh, take, lo love to take the opportunity to introduce Belmec Limited. Um, from, from our perspective, uh, Velmec Limited, one of strong relationships and resilient growth. And by that, I mean, our focus has always remained on, on these strong relationships with all stakeholders and, and clients, no doubt, um, which we know will underpin our resilient growth uh, moving forward. We're, essentially, we're a specialist contractor delivering in-house and niche end-to-end -end solutions. And we across a variety of sectors, energy resources and, and infrastructure. Um, led by a proven and reputable management team, um, uh, uh, a couple of directors that have been working together for you know, over 30 years, um, uh, and, and obviously an experienced management team supporting that at, at executive level. Strong national footprint, and um, we currently uh, uh, are working through a significant levels of um, repeat contract work through T1 and, and diversified clients. Uh, a construction work in gas and infrastructure development continues to be under underpinned by strong government narrative uh, as, as we speak. So that's really giving some resilience around the revenues and the order book moving forward into, into this year and, and, and next as well. Um, a current asset services strategy is, is also transitioning Belmec into a full asset life cycle provider. So by, by that, I mean really delivering uh, an increased exposure to reoccurring revenue streams across the group for the years ahead. Um, construct and, uh, and finally, I think one, a key a couple of key points. Um, this strong and resilient environment and our performance to date uh, has delivered record uh, first half 21 results. Um, and, uh, and part of that, and, and part of the um, messages today is, is really seeing Velmec as a recognised first mover in the emerging hydrogen sector. As to performance, um, our first half performance delivered record earnings and, and cash flow generation to 31 December. Um, we we uh, secured our largest ever service asset services contract with Origin Energy, uh, over $100 million over, over five years, providing compression facility, well, well, uh, well site mate, mechanical and electrical maintenance services. Uh, we ended the year and are currently churning through a significant pipeline of construction and service opportunities currently valued at $1.1 billion and currently working through a forward order book of over 200 million with 67% of these um, representing reoccurring revenue from long existing clients. So certainly with that, uh, that uh, landscape and, and certainly the order book, we're well positioned to deliver record revenues for this full year, um, celebrating over 3 million hours lost time injuries free, free during the period, um, and which really see that, saw our total recordable injury frequency rate uh, being retained at, at, at low levels of 0.56. So in essence, you know, a half year of uh, revenues of $61 million, uh, driving a, an EBITDA generation of 6.1 million. And the most pleasing bit out of, out of the half year performance was a strong um, measure of cash flow uh, from, from operations, uh, generating 7.3 million for the six months. So about Velmec, um, our current, so as a snapshot of our current service offering, uh, Velmec today generates approximately 70% of our revenues through construction delivery, whilst the remaining 30% is generated from our asset services business units. Our broad disciplines, as can be seen from the diagram, can be best summed up by construct, commission, and maintain. Uh, delivering, a major, delivering major upstream gas and water infrastructure via a unique sole source sales proposition. And by that, I mean, you know, we, we engage with the clients through CapEx developments from design through to construction, through to maintenance and operations, and then asset testing and refurbishment. Over the past five years, Velmex de de has developed its national presence with delivery of projects and service contracts throughout Australia, as can be seen. With key facilities in Perth and Brisbane and expanding footprint in Northern Territory and Southwest Queensland, 
Nomex today has grown over th has grown to over 360 employees, both living and working near our target markets. In relation to in, into, in relation to health and safety culture, uh, uh, our no compromise approach to safety underpins this. We we have strong safety leadership messaging, which is which is imperative for our business operations, and that drives our internal continuous improvement of objectives. During this financial year, all that came to play. We celebrated over 3 million hours lost time injury free, which was an important milestone for our team, but one also supported by our industry leading uh, total recordable injury frequency rate of 0.56. We also hold federal safety accreditation status, which was only possible as a, strong, as a, as a result of this strong health and safety culture. And finally, our long-term commitment to local and indigenous relationships in, in particular was recently acknowledged by the accreditation of our reconciliation, reconciliation, uh, reconciliation action plan, being recognised for the ongoing development of our Innovate framework. As can be seen from the historical five-year revenue trend graph, Valmex revenues have experienced ex excellent business growth through an established blue chip client base and are expected to continue to grow further in FY21. It's our established track record that will ensure that our asset services strategy, a strategy to deliver our next phase of significant growth, will also succeed. Again, we finished the half year strong, first half results, delivering record earnings and cash flow, and placing Velmec firmly on track to deliver record revenues for this full financial year. And finally, we kicked off a, a new calendar year with a strong order book and a buoyant pipeline or over 1.1 billion of future contract opportunities. So I talk a bit about the asset services strategy and, and, um, and how imperative and how, and how we're transitioning into this. Um, and this, this slide really takes us through uh, essentially where we're, where we're targeting the business to be uh, over the next several years. And it's really around being the, um, building the most trusted specialist services group in the delivery of projects, operations and maintenance services, the full cradle to grave solution and transitioning Velmec into a one-stop shop which takes us through the whole construction, commission and maintain um, landscape. And how? Well, the whole purpose behind this is, is working closely with clients to increase asset life and lower their total cost of ownership for our clients, leveraging our industry recognised early contract involvement status, uh, which already delivers a broad range of asset services from conception to, de to decommissioning, whilst we're also targeting mergers and acquisitions currently, which will round out our Velmec service offering. All in all, we are building and tracking towards building a business model that will be hard to replicate. Expanding the focus, or in other words, what I like to call Velmec 2.0. What does it look like? It's a future order book, which is set to be dominated by reoccurring revenue streams, both in construction and services. A current four order book of $200 million has, has, has set us on our way with 67% of these represented by reoccurring revenue with existing clients and new sectors that are being developed. A stronger FY21 revenue position expanding to a three-year target of $300 million. A 70% 30% sales mix dominated by construction, which is, which is the current uh, sales mix, transitioning to a 50-50 sales mix as a result of expanding asset service revenues. One of, one of the rationales and one of the, I guess, drivers for this uh, confidence around building a asset services and a, and a more of a diversified revenue mix is really um, testament to our growing diversification. By way of example, our asset services currently, for, and you see on the left-hand side of that screen, our asset services currently being delivered to Origin Energy and APLNG in Southwest Queensland and are developed through long-term relationships, local content strategy, and expanding footprint and capabilities. Moving to the right, our upstream energy construction to support our industry for the long term. And recently, a large scale domestic gas project on behalf of Senex Energy. Belmont gas compression and facility construction expertise um, achieve a successful project for Senex and a fast track domestic gas project delivering gas in a record time for a greenfield project. 
from our water utility side in Western Australia, key water infrastructure expertise has seen Velmet become an important long-term partner for water corporation in Western Australia. For metropolitan water networks to regional processing and storage, water infrastructure expertise delivered across Australia will continue to be a key revenue contributor for uh, Velmec. And finally, hydrogen, which we'll continue to talk more of as, as, we, as we progress through the next 12 to 18 months. Velmec, there's no, there's, uh, we're, we're lucky enough that Velmec is an early player in the rapidly emerging hydrogen sector. We are engaged by Australian Gas Infrastructure Group, AGIG, to deliver their EPC project at Hydrogen Park in South Australia. Belmec is now actively sought after to deliver similar facilities around Australia, which is quite exciting uh, for the group where it's, um, where it's come from and, and really hydrogen will pave a way um, as we develop our, uh, our future energy capabilities across the sectors. And that leads us into what I call right place, right time. Again, strong client relationships, growing capabilities and diversified sectors have brought us to where we are today and exposure to many highly active and resilient sectors in energy, water and resources. We move to our East Coast gas crisis and as you can see on the screen now, we're well positioned to support the East Coast. We're seeing diminishing outputs of gas from Southern states, which are poised to leave Victoria and New South Wales with shortages within three years. The government gas fired recovery producer initiatives will also require additional support to really achieve the goals that we're trying to, uh, to, to get through with the East Coast uh, gas shortages. LNG import projects and hydrogen are expected to play their part over the longer term. Belmec, on the other hand, is well positioned through its client networks, East Coast footprint and significant gas experience to participate through this expansion. We're also, we're also well leveraged to the water sector. Water upgrades and security appear on the government priority list and, and post COVID, nationally significant infrastructure needs around Australia are consistently added to this infrastructure priority list. It is well known Australian government budget initiatives are focusing on, on bolstering water security and regional development across, across the country. Velmet significant engineering, construction and service experience on key water structure in WA will be also leveraged for East Coast expansions. And finally, let's talk about hydrogen. We can see hydrogen emerging as a key driver in the global push to decarbonize, to, to, to decarbonize emissions intensive sectors. The National Hydrogen Stra Strategy from 2019 creates a framework for a clean, innovative, safe and competitive hydrogen industry for both domestic and energy export by 2030. Quite clearly, benefits of hydrogen, producing no carbon dioxide emissions when used as a fuel, it can be produced as a gas or a liquid or made as part of uh, other materials, um, underpins the resilience of renewables, which tend to be intermittent in, in, intermittent in nature. Um, and certainly we're looking at hydrogen, in the, the hydrogen sector as a, as a key in, in use in road transport, aviation, shipping, steel production and refineries. And of course, on the, on the cusp of developing a major export industry in, the, in that particular sector. Valmec considers itself to have a first mover advantage, having, having successfully delivered AGIG's first plant in South Australia. During that phase, we've developed a strong hydrogen EPC skill set in the area of concept design, construction, commissioning, and OEM operation support. Valmec's now actively sought after, after, after by new proponents, hydrogen technology OEMs, and engineering houses for its expertise for other developments around Australia. Today, as we develop this new sector, we're quite excited. We, we are a major player in, in this exciting and rapidly growing um, industry and currently tracking over 260 million in active opportunities over the short term. Powering forward, as, as I get to the end of the uh, presentation today, I guess really it, my, my takeaways today um, Velmec is well positioned to, to, to continue to achieve revenue growth, and that will be dri uh, driven by government stimulus infrastructure spend, the gas-led economic recovery, asset services growth underpinned by our, the major maintenance cycle in energy, uh, targeted growth in national water sectors, and of course hydrogen as a highly prospective emergency energy source. 
We'll, of course, execute targeted merger and acquisition opportunities to expand our client base, to increase our skill set across key growth areas, and to deliver synergies across the group. There's no doubt that transitioning Belmec into a full service asset life cycle with strong reoccurring revenues will position us well to really focus on our quality of earnings in the year ahead. And finally, uh, and I mentioned in the previous slides, it's really our exposure to burgeoning and diversified sectors in energy, water, and resources, which I think believe, which, which I think place Belmec right place, right time. And in summary, a forward order book of over $200 million of which you know, reoccurring revenue uh, comprises 60% of our order book, a tender pipeline of $1.1 billion. And I guess for FY21, all, that's, all that said, we're well positioned now to deliver uh, record revenue and earnings for the full year FY21. This, ladies and gentlemen, this is Belmec, and I'm Steve Droplich, Managing Director, and thank you for watching. Back to you, Mark, for any questions. Uh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, we actually have a plethora of questions. So I'm not sure if we're going to get to Mark as I've. Uh, oh, okay. That's, I've got, that's I've got two thing. sets that were uh, from two different uh, people who e emailed in ahead of time, and I see a good few has come in uh, as you've been talking. So I I'm going to switch between them all, and hopefully I can get one or two from from everybody and, and try to be fair. Um, there's a good few on dividends, so, so maybe let's tackle them in, in order. Um, I think you called out the, the half year result, you know, you're hoping to get back to paying a dividend um, at the end of the financial year. You know, one of the questions is, you know, is that still on track? And, you know, when would you think shareholders are going to be advised that? Will that be with the, the full year result or, um, you know, a, a, even ahead of that, depending on how um, the final quarter goes? Yeah. Um, oh. Uh, we 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 put we we looked at the dividend policy quite cl uh, closely, and obviously we've um, you know being a being a young company, and you and you look at your dividend strategy from time to time, and certainly um, the level of support we've had over the over the years, we looked at the dividend strategy as a way of rewarding our shareholders over over their support over over seven to eight years as we've been listed. Um, certainly coming into the half year and the full year, and and the quality of our forward order book. Um, we, we sat down and, and said we will we will look at that dividend strategy very very closely, um, and we are expecting to be in a position to be able to make that call um, at the at at the full year uh, mark. So at the earliest, I would suggest we we normally get to about um, probably probably late May and, and early June when we look at these uh, uh, at these results. We try to get um, some some indications out to the market as soon as we're comfortable enough. Um, certainly what we're seeing here, it's well underpinned. Uh, we're on track and, and uh, yeah, we would look to probably make an announcement of, of sorts, um, uh, possibly as early as, uh, as June, um, but definitely by you know, late July, early, early August, as our auditors are, um, start to get entrenched. Um, the, the, as soon as we can, we will. Um, but at this stage, I, I, I consider we, you know, we, we remain on track um, and, uh, and certainly our, you know, we talk about we expect targeted um, record earnings, and, and uh, which is which is probably the most important KPI here. We, we are still expecting record earnings for the full year, and um, we'll we'll proceed on that basis. Uh, and then another question on the dividend. Um, I, it wasn't in your um, presentation, but I know uh, it's a quite a tight register. Um, yep. And have the board looked at doing a underwritten DRP um, to, you know, maybe improve liquidity and slightly kind of broaden the, the, the shareholder base um, to kind of, uh, you know, get a better spread uh, on that register. Um, obviously, DRP is one of many considerations when we, when we first started, um, you know, really just modelling up what the dividends uh, dividend could be or what a dividend strategy could be. So it's, it, it, as, I, as I say, the DRP could be one initiative on the table. Um, and certainly liquidity on the, on the register um, is, is always you know, it's, it's front of mind. We, we look at that uh, quite regularly. Um, I guess through, through that, through that uh, perspective, you know, DRP is one strategy, but I think also as we grow, and, and, I, and I spoke about, um, I spoke about uh, uh, M&A activity um, continuing and we, we are very much 
active in there. We are looking closely at uh, key acquisitions um, and key capabilities that we like to bring into the group. I think that transactional event will be a liquidity event in itself. Um, and certainly, you know, with the market, um, I, I guess, uh, pricing us um, obviously a lot more differently than when, when we look, we're looking at the barrel, you know, late last, cal uh, late last calendar year. And we're certainly in a position now where potentially a, um, you know, utilising potentially a, a, a merger and acquisition event may introduce new equity, new, new shareholders and so forth. That may in itself be a liquidity event as well. So um, I, I guess from that perspective, yeah, there are some certain strategies on, on the table. Um, and again, it's, it's, it really is about trying to retain value um, in our business. We understand, we, well, we think, um, uh, we think, you know, and, and obviously you're probably going to get every CEO saying we think we're undervalued. Um, but from our perspective, you know, we're looking at our quality of earnings, we're looking at our forward projections um, based on our peer valuations and so forth. Uh, we think there's still some movement, but certainly the pricing at the moment, um, you know, owes well for a successful acquisition transaction, a transaction as well. So, uh, yeah, there are a couple of initiatives there, and and but certainly we, you know, liquidity events. Um, uh, we we are cognizant of that as well. Yeah, and maybe if I let's just wrap up these dividend questions then. Um, uh, wh where are you guys in terms of paying tax and accumulating franking credits in the in the current half year? And you know, is there a possibility of the if there is a dividend, would it be fully franked or or, or partially franked? Um, I'll have to take that one on notice, Mark. Um, okay. Obviously, yeah, um, I, I don't have the uh, the level of franking at the moment. We have, we have. I'm, I'm aware of. Um, obviously, our intention for all shareholders is, is to frank as, as much as we can. Um, but but whether it will be fully franked or partially, um, no, no, I can't. I can't sort of comment on that one today. Um, but, well, let's, yes, but uh, we you were mentioning M and A, so it's a good segue into into yeah. M and A. Um, the three hundred million in in revenue by uh, uh, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was FY twenty three. You said, um, yep. is that all kind of organic growth and and executing on that that tender pipeline, or does that include M um, and A within that three hundred million? It includes M and A in that three hundred million, um, and and we've 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 assessed that based on the I guess some of the uh, some of the acquisition uh, works that or, or I, I guess um, uh, reviewed review works we've done with potential targets and what they can bring into the organisation over that period of time. Putting that in perspective, though, we expect uh, of the three hundred uh, sixty five to seventy percent of that will be organic. Um, on at a, as a conservative level, so we we you know, we're looking at this from a where do we think we'll be conservatively uh, with no acquisitions with with existing um, structures and existing capabilities and so forth, and we're comfortable enough to say that we'll we'll be getting close to sixty five to seventy percent of that. Um, we expect to be at that level anyway. Um, but yeah, certainly from a perspective of acquisitions, and we're we, we're quite uh, quite motivated on that because it does lend itself to the greater asset services strategy. Um, we are looking at 300 as a target, and we've set ourselves that that goal, albeit a bit lofty. But um, we're element of confidence we'll get there, and that's why we're uh, targeting that quite strongly. And then a follow up onto that, um, Steve. Um, multiples uh, for M and A. You know, you know what would look uh, an attractive multiple to to you guys uh, for for a new target. Obviously, the lower the better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, um, look, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult one. Um, you know, it's um, it, you you look at um, you, you know, obviously, front of mind is earnings accretion. We're looking at you know, we're looking at at the end of the day we, when we put the two pieces together, how, what does that look for look like for you know, Belmec shareholders and making sure that you know we we we, we choose correctly. Um, but so certainly, yeah. So certainly, from that perspective, I'd, rather than lock ourselves into something, you know, um, um, you know, we various discussions have taken us from a journey, and I'd, I like to say we can we can cap out at three, but I realise you, you probably won't be able to. So there'll be different sec different businesses out there that you would look at that have long sustaining revenue trails, which which may um, lend itself to greater valuation. So um, yeah, so it's a it really a difficult question to answer, and. Um, and and I guess I can really just you know emphasise that earnings accretion um, after a transaction 
um, and making sure the shareholders um, can see the benefit in, in that acquisition is probably front of mind. Okay. And then can you comment on, you know, when you're going up against uh, competitors in gas and, and water, you know, who, who are you competing against on, the, on, on these bids? And I guess what, what separates Valmec from, the, from some of your competitors? Yeah, I think um, uh, our, our competitors, um, I guess, our, our tender listing in our competitor landscape differs across the various sectors, and that's uh, and that's no doubt. You know, um, our sales mix to date has very much been around um, some sweet spot projects, ten to fifteen million dollars. Um, you get the occasional twenty to twenty five, um, and. Uh, and, and really, as we continue to grow, you, you're doing more projects and so forth. That model over the over the last probably 12 to 18 has seen projects get bigger. Um, and you know, you you would look at some of the tier one contractors that that are you know are traditionally structured around building you know 100 million or 200 million dollar gas plants, of which we we look in the market and then there's probably not many of those that get, will hit the table over the next. Uh, next probably two to three years. So you have these tier ones looking backwards and, and uh, they have to fill their own order book. So, but, but, so you, we would get a collection of tier ones, potentially tier twos, um, other, other um, players trying to enter the, the gas space and all the water space in particular. Um, so it's a variety of, of um, um, uh, I guess, players, but it really boils down to what clients, clients are looking at, um, I guess, um, CV, their ex expertise, quality of systems, um, you know, a comfort level that, you know, when, when, they, when you know, they procure a contractor on site, uh, albeit a, 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 a like, like a Valmec, um, they want that surety that, um, that the project will be completed on time, um, on budget, and obviously, you know, with, with HSC uh, front of mind as, as well. So that in itself presents a variety of barriers to, for, for other players entering our space. Um, oil and gas in particular, very, very uh, uh, particular around uh, systems and processes. So there is a strong barrier to entry there. Uh, water itself, uh, another, another barrier to entry. Um, and, uh, but, you know, within each sector, there's, there's some, there, there is some, you know, other, other players and, and, um, and uh, you know, and, and the regular players that we come up against. Um, so from that perspective, um, yeah, I, th I think we're, I think we're quite insulated. We, as I say, we, we stick to our key sectors stick and, and work consistently with clients. And, and that is really a testament to what I talked about before. 67% um, of our order book is, is um, our returnable clients. And uh, so if you look at our, if, I guess if you look at our assets, as, um, our accounts receivable ledger, looking at our construction plays in particular, um, from, from we are, you know, we, we, we tend to have a, um, probably a low number of, of, of key clients, um, but reoccurring, absolute reoccurring. And we could be doing three or four projects for the same client during, during a, a financial period. And that's just because of uh, return client, that um, uh, we're, we're shortlisted, we're, we're proven commodity uh, and clients uh, reluctant to introduce new players. Um, as for differentiators, um, look, I like, I like to think that it really is what I talked about in, in the presentation. Um, the cradle to grave or, or the sole source proposition that we bring to the table. Um, we're really walking into a client and, and saying, look, just write the one purchase order, uh, just give it to Velbeck and we'll take care of your issues. We'll take care of your permitting issues. We'll take care of your interface issues between different disciplines. Um, at the end of the day, you, you will write a one purchase order and we'll give you the keys to, to start your plant, essentially, uh, in, a, in, a, in layman's terms. And I guess that's what we're trying to produce here. We're, we're trying to negate the need and, and trying to negate the need for contractors to deflect blame against each other. We're happy to be accountable and we're happy to deliver a, um, a, you know, a cost conscious, a quality conscious, and obviously a safe conscious project to a client. And I, I think that is our, our strongest differentiator. Um, so yeah, we won't be um, we 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 won't be all for you know for for we won't be we won't present a a I guess a global approach for everyone, um, but but we are very much um, you know focusing on our our key sweet spots, um, and we've selected some key sweet spots in our in those target sectors I talked about, which I think are quite resilient and and will continue to support us in the years ahead. Okay, we're, we're on 10, Steve, but have you got five more minutes to, to tackle a few others? Yeah, provided not too curly. <laughs>
Um, just on, you know, where the, the business is going, you know, you're, you're trying to get to a, a nice even split 50% on the construction side and, and 50% on the asset service side at the revenue level. How do the, you know, gross margins kind of compare be, be, between both divisions? Um, yeah, I think I think traditional pure construction plays, and and you'll see that um, uh, you'll see that from a variety of tier ones and tier twos that are very very much construction um, orientated. Um, yeah, the, the, without without putting numbers on the table, um, yeah, they uh, obviously the the construction plays are somewhat, you know, sometimes you you you're looking at um, probably high. Um, sevens to eights to nines in terms of EBITDA generation from a construction play, and other times you look at some of the larger tier ones producing you know fours and fives. Um, from a from a servicing perspective um, and our and our long term services plays, I guess it's really based on what you're bringing to the table. Now there are organisations that bring large scale service um, um, operations to a, to a client, and and margins look. You know, to, to me, they look quite linear and, and um, a little bit sharp because it boils down to the capabilities that you're bringing to the table. If you're if you're there bringing uh, uh, labour and and a secondment labour to to clients to help them through various activities, large scale labour recruitment and so forth, I, I don't think you could expect to generate significant margins on that. Um, it's just it's just the, the way the, the the facts of the industry are. You know, you you are supplying labour um, and, and general labour to to work with the client. Uh, from our perspective, though, we try to you know um, uh, I think uh, transition from that, and and we are doing that with specialist technicians, specialist asset testing, um, integrity testing, and so forth, which lends itself to a premium. Um, so when you when you look at our our model, uh, and this is where the fifty fifty comes in, it really is that um, I guess that hybrid mix of um, you know, picking up any any shortfalls in EBITDA through potentially which may come through construction between six to seven to eight percent EBIT, um, supplemented by stronger uh, service service type uh, margins, which hopefully get us to a business model, and and we're we're quite confident that we'll get there uh, north of you know, nine to ten percent EBITDA uh, uh, on, on top line revenues. Um, so that that's you know, and that's not. Um, you know, that's that's something that we've looked at, um, I guess, historically. Looked at uh, you know some of our first half, half uh, first half earnings, and as we transition, we expect that uh, recovery to get stronger through scale and so forth. So I think we're comfortable enough now, looking at our overhead structure, our size, um, the, the the revenue that uh, we expect to come in, and certainly the sectors we're playing in and what we what we produce for a client, that our, our margins should be fairly robust. Um, and and I and I guess competitive at the same time based on the based on the fact that um, we are presenting that full integrated solution to a client as opposed to um, little pockets of of, of capability. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, rather than getting specifically into you know each uh, each margin from each sector, it is it is an evolving um, business model. Um, but certainly what we're seeing, we're we're fairly bullish on what we think we can achieve out of that that hybrid um, mix as we get into 2023. Okay, let's do two, two last ones and uh, um, okay. what, one on COVID. Um, I know WA has had, you know, very strict um, border restrictions. Um, you know, what does that look like now that things are easing up in terms of just operationally for you to, you know, get going on projects, move teams onto sites or, you know, transfer kind of, you know, key leadership from, you know, from one office to another office. And, um, you know, I, I, that's been a, you know, right across ag, mine, Absolutely. everywhere, you know, the, the state border closures and the international border closures has really impacted um, getting people on site uh, and in the right location. So maybe just comment like how, how the, I guess, relaxation has impacted, you know, business or business <clears throat> getting moving or back to normal. Yeah, um, yeah, and he's, 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 you're certainly on the mark, you know, as as all contractors and all, I guess, all essentially the business community. Um, COVID was a major disruptor, certainly with um, 
you know, Australia being a, a small country in the scale of things and, and your resources situated around Australia um, and having some key specialist uh, resources in other parts of Australia, trying to get them into, into your client's backyard over, over a border was, was quite challenging during that period. Now, you're right, the borders have, have opened up, so you expect some easing there. Um, I, look, I guess, I guess holistically, you, you look at where we've come from um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll use this example of what we're trying to do in uh, southwest Queensland um, with, with our client origin. Um, COVID, COVID has, has been a wake-up call for, um, for some of our key clients who are looking at um, their, their contractors, looking at this, their support networks, and I guess our, key cl our clients are looking at their own operations and thinking, what if it happens again? You know, and, and certainly through our phase, our employees you know, during, during the peak of COVID um, itself, our employees, um, you know, did everything they can do. And I, and I commend our employees for, you know, some of them lived away from families for up to three months, um, supporting Velmex, supporting their clients. And you can never, um, you never thank, you know, thank this team enough for doing that. But do I really want to put them again in that potential exposure, uh, with a potential exposure going forward if something else happens? And, and I guess really, you know, it's about building resilience moving forward. Um, our clients are, are seriously looking that at the moment in terms of what they're trying to do with their um, operations and contractors, and Velmex adapting as well. And and I, I point to the fact of our origin um, project in um, a contract in Roma, where we are um, uh, working closely with Origin to to develop a a new Roma hub, which will it, uh, Roma in southwest Queensland, which will be there uh, to support obviously the client, but also su support the community in terms of, you know, as we grow, uh, the intention there is to train up local content, is to engage local content, and over time develop that mix of, of individuals um, and source locally with, with the surrounding regions that, uh, s such that if there is a, um, an event, uh, again, um, certainly a client, clients have a lot more comfort that their operations um, you know, have less, uh, less, less impact. But from our perspective and as employers, um, I certainly don't want my employees living away from family up to three months again. Um, and I want them obviously close to the action as well. So they're, they're the mitigants we're putting in play and, and we certainly started that. And, and, and obviously training and cross-skilling is, is a key part of that. Um, and, and technology itself, trying to do more on-site uh, through less time, you know, and, and just really taking the pressure off workforces that need to mobilise. But answer your question, Going back, obviously border um, border restrictions ceasing will help our flow. Uh, will will beef up productivity on site. You don't have to you know worry about uh, having to you know mob and demob um, continually and to to align with government regulations and so forth. So um, so yeah, positive. Um, uh, our clients are obviously um, experiencing some comeback and, and their teams are coming back into offices, which is fantastic. So you you would expect there'd be less tension on projects, you expect to be projects to be uh, executed more efficiently, but it really is a wake up call for, I, I guess, our industry um, to look at uh, how we execute and where our people uh, are situated and, and trying to get our, uh, trying to get local people that are closest to our client to be, to be our, our workforce, our workforces of the future. Okay. Steve, we're, we're, we're going to have to leave it there. We've already uh, ran over time uh, and I think stolen enough of your time. Uh, thank you so much for tackling as many of the questions there as you could. Um, oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we were meant to do this um, March 2020 live in Sydney. Uh, it yep. happened, but I'm, I'm glad we got there. We got there in the end. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for thanks for allowing me the opportunity, and uh, it's been great uh, talking to you, talking to you and your subscribers this morning. Great. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll have another morning meeting next week, and I'll uh, send out the details um, in due course. Uh, everybody, have a great day.